Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, business growth through e-commerce. Um, obviously, e-commerce has been around for many, many years, uh, but has enjoyed a particular resurgence um, over the last two to three years, and really an explosion with a number of different uh, e-commerce facilities and sites and websites and concepts and techniques um, uh, going out there. So there's quite a, a myriad of options that are available. And uh, this is going to be a quick uh, deep dive into the range uh, of possibilities uh, that exist out there uh, in order to help support you and your business and maybe consider next steps you might want to, to take um, through the rest of this year and into next year. Um, we're having a few um, different discussion points here. Um, you see that uh, from our um, agenda here, we're quite top heavy on Amazon. This is a particular area of expertise for myself and um, a, a very strong area of interest. Uh, my background is actually selling on Amazon, seven years uh, of that experience, about 100,000 orders a year, 60% um, here in the UK and about 30% in the EU, 10% uh, further afield. So it is quite a, a huge opportunity there and I'll be drawing from several of my experiences um, to share with you uh, today. Um, but I think the other um, kind of headline here is that Amazon do things so well. They are so far advanced, such a big player in the marketplace, in the range of e-commerce spaces, that if that's a, a marketplace and, and an environment that you can crack, um, then almost every other single marketplace becomes quite easy uh, for you to just extend out to. So we'll be covering some of those other options a little bit later on in the presentation. Give you a little bit of a uh, heads up already about my own uh, experience. So I've been in the uh, dot-com world now for 20 plus years, um, particularly selling on Amazon, as I say, for the last uh, seven years. Um, and a lot of the product that I sell is actually extremely low margin, where you're making sort of 10p or 50p or a pound or something on top of that. So a lot of the experience that I've got is um, actually advising businesses on how to turn a profit in the face of low margins and increasing costs um, throughout the supply chain. Um, I don't only do uh, Amazon. It sounds like uh, a lot of work there. 100,000 orders uh, a year is a lot of work. There's a lot of, sort of compliance stuff and customer service stuff that goes into back end, but I, I do try to get away from the, the PC. I do a lot of exercise. I love London. Um, I live in central London, and I do a lot of uh, walks through London for, for pleasure and also uh, introduce um, other other people to this fantastic city that has been my home for about the last 22 years. So let's um, let's get into some of these uh, marketplaces. Let's start with Amazon. Um, you've probably heard uh, the founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos. So he he was at the helm of Amazon for about 20 odd years. He's he's just retired and, and handed over the reins to, to someone else. But he has long said that Amazon's vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything that they might want to buy online. And if you've had any degree, any experience with Amazon, and we'll look at the Amazon ecosystem in a couple of minutes, any touch point with Amazon, you've probably got an experience, a very positive experience that re resonates very, very well with this mission statement. Amazon wanted to work. They want the service, the cost, the entire experience to be consistent with customer expectations. And this goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier, that once you can adhere to those policies and the, um, the, the, the way of trading on Amazon, and when you're in the Amazon mindset, and pretty much selling on every other marketplace is easy. Let's talk about the opportunity itself. Um, so Amazon is a complex ecosystem. It's not just a company. You have probably um, had some form of interaction with Amazon before. The most likely one is simply buying on Amazon and having that little brown box or brown envelope come to your door with something inside it, maybe something for the home, maybe a, a gift for friend or family, um, maybe something for your office, maybe there's a, a B2B uh, purchase that you've made. So it, it works through the, the prime membership system. You know that you can go on, you can browse a range of products, 
um, select the one that's right for you and it comes to your door and there you go. That's the end of the engagement. Or is it? If something goes wrong, you know that there's always a support behind you that you can go back and uh, maybe make a change or do a return or, or something, whatever the case might be. You just know that it works. And think about other engagements with other uh, retail or e-tail uh, marketplaces, which maybe don't make it that easy. Perhaps you've got some experience um, with, as I say, Amazon Prime or uh, video or Kindle or Whole Foods. As you can see, there are a number of different uh, aspects to the Amazon world. It's a trillion dollar company. So there's a, a huge amount out there. And this graphic um, just shows us some of the examples of what one can expect when dealing with the Amazon uh, ecosystem itself. So um, just have a think, if you don't mind, please, and uh, maybe drop some, some ideas in chat. Um, do you know of any brands on Amazon? Do you have any favorite products that you, uh, that you buy from Amazon on a regular basis? And maybe um, you've had a chance to explore uh, other permutations and combinations. Maybe there's a particular item that you buy and you typically buy in one size and one color, but maybe you go back and see if it's available as a variation. So um, just have a think about that and, uh, and see if there's anything that rapidly springs to mind. We'll go on to the next screen. Now, talking about brands, um, as I say, most of our interaction um, as regular customers of products on Amazon is uh, with a subset of Amazon called um, Seller Central. There's a place called Vendor Central and there are other different components of Amazon, but generally you have sellers like you and me that make goods available on Amazon in warehouses or in our own warehouses and use Amazon as a front end to promote those goods to a customer base. And we've all seen Amazon listings. We've all seen uh, what, what they look like and, and have probably experienced the checkout process where you actually select and pay and configure your credit card and delivery address and so on and so forth and eventually get the product. Also within Amazon, a lot of these brands have what they call branded pages or, or, or part of the brand registry within Amazon. And that gives them a little bit extra. That gives them almost like a Facebook style page where they can promote their goods. I'm not sure if you've ever purchased from this one company called Song Mix. I, I know I certainly have. They do furniture and shelving and a number of um, household and, and office kind of um, supplies. Um, I'm happy with their service. I'm happy with their product. Uh, and from time to time, I'll go on to their brand page that they've registered for and they've done some additional configuration for within Amazon um, to just see what else they've got on offer. As you can see, this particular screen that we've captured here talks about spring options. So we're talking about home and garden, garden furniture, enjoying drinks outside, maybe looking after your, your garden and plants and that sort of thing. And of course, they will be able to change this imagery from season to season so that they can always promote um, something that's accurate and topical and of interest to their customer audience. Now, what you can see is this menu option here. Um, this is just a screenshot, so I won't be able to interact with that. But we've got different options, home, hello, spring, bestsellers, and so on. And as you engage with this uh, menu option, you'll be able to see different products maybe get videos, maybe get PDF of instruction manuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We go on to Amazon Basics. Again, perhaps you've been able to purchase um, a product on Amazon Basics. Um, I, know, I know I certainly have. Uh, my backpack, a bit of a, a favorite uh, item in, in my wardrobe is an Amazon Basics backpack. And it's great, it works. It's got all sorts of pockets and, um, you know, proper padding and so on and so forth. It's actually quite interesting because Amazon Basics um, perhaps suggests that the product isn't of um, the quality that you might expect, but actually everything that I've ordered off Amazon Basics has been incredibly reliable and uh, a, a very, very good uh, purchase. But you can see what they're doing here with the branding, the logo, the Amazon orange color is very much front and center. 
there's consistency there in terms of um, the various menu options that are available that match the category items of what they sell. There is um, a, a, an opportunity here where Amazon is going out and appealing to different types of shoppers. It's not cluttered. It's very easy to see what the actual categories are, what the products are themselves. And it's also um, quite good that they've got some visuals there. You've got computer accessories as text and also um, a picture of a mouse. So depending on what type of shopper you are, whether you like to read or whether you like to go after uh, sort of more visual imagery, you know where to go. So it's a lot of this thinking about how are we presenting the myriad of things that we do and products that we sell in a way that is really captivating and interesting to the customer. It's this sort of opportunity and range of flexibility that Amazon offers to sellers. In terms of range of opportunity and, and what's possible for the seller, well, Amazon has a presence in nearly 20 different countries. So all of the countries um, shown in blue, there's a full presence. So here we are in the UK, there's an amazon.co.uk, which we've all probably interacted with at least once in our lives. Um, going into France, there's an amazon.fr, an amazon.es for Spain, amazon.ca for Canada, et cetera, et cetera. And the nice thing about the Amazon experience is that it is largely consistent worldwide. America, so amazon.com, is the most advanced. That's where it started. That's where they're really pioneering um, a lot of different functionality and a lot of uh, new tools and services. And there are other countries which are quite new to the onboarding system. So um, Australia is the newest of the group or one of the newest of the group. So maybe their range of functionality um, available to the seller is not as sophisticated as the US or the UK or the German versions. Turkey is relatively new as well to the Amazon marketplace, and they simply integrate with Amazon uh, Germany. So any product that you might buy in, in Turkey comes from a German warehouse. Um, Amazon Saudi Arabia, interesting what happened here is that they actually bought, Amazon bought souk.com or souk.co.sa, I believe it is. And they, they made that purchase about two or three years ago. So Souk was an online marketplace that was available in the Middle East. Amazon simply bought them, um, did a lot of backend integration, and after about a year or so, launched as Amazon.sa. So again, we're driving home the point here that if you want to start on uh, a marketplace, Amazon is probably a pretty good one because they're local and they offer uh, UK-specific services. But equally, if you want to expand, then there is an established consistency around the world. There'll be local rules and local uh, marketplace engagement services, but as you can see, it's quite easy to expand worldwide. Okay, the Amazon journey. So there are really three routes to market when it comes to wanting to sell on Amazon. And again, I'm gonna be referring um, consistently to opportunities which exist within Seller Central. So Vendor Central is a different type of marketplace, Merch by Amazon, which is print on demand for t-shirts and pillowcases and bags and that sort of thing is again, a different marketplace. Kindle is a different marketplace. Today's presentation and what we're talking about within the Amazon world is specifically um, sellers central. And there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sellers, um, small organizations that might be trading out of home, trading from the kitchen table. Those types of sellers exist. A lot of SMEs, the, the bulk of traffic on Amazon uh, itself comes from SMEs. So that's organizations that might be just breaking out from micro business into very, very small uh, and medium sized enterprise straight up through to organizations of up to 250 staff and roughly 50 million pound turnover per year. That's where the majority of, of sales activity happens. Um, and then of course, there are major world brands. We've seen Coca-Cola, we've seen Nike, we've seen Sony. There are major, major brands in the Amazon space as well. So to um, stream each one of these, we're looking at three different categories, an individual seller, so that could be a small or a large organization 
that might be uh, reselling um, goods. Okay, so in, in my case, um, I represent, gosh, about three or four other brands that wanted to be on Amazon. And we sell a lot of their products and adhere to a lot of their uh, rules about restrictions in, micro, uh, in marketplaces or opportunities for new marketplaces. And we position their product accordingly and work with them to ensure that their, that their product is uh, trading to the best competitive advantage that it can. The second category where we have in that second yellow box, large seller or in, an independent brand. So that would be um, you know, more a medium scale or large scale uh, SME that would have its own product, its own brand, its own manufacturing process. And um, that would be interested in selling on Amazon and uh, maybe expanding to different marketplaces, different countries using the Amazon platform. And then we have new and emerging brands that are coming out. So brands that um, want to perhaps their, their own e-commerce marketplaces, maybe a Shopify or maybe on eBay or maybe um, some other website, and then are looking to really expand and harness uh, the consumer uh, credentials that exist within the Amazon marketplace. So again, a question for chat, and we can pick this up later on. Which one are you if, if you want to share that? If you don't, that's, that's fine. But which category do you fit? Going back to the previous slide, do you feel that you, um, you're a shop that is representing other brands? Are you a larger independent brand with your own product line already sell, selling on Amazon and perhaps wanting to expand out? Or are you an emerging brand or perhaps you're uh, an established brand elsewhere, just have not considered the Amazon world just yet? I see chat activity, which is great, but I'm not actually um, looking at the content and perhaps we can discuss any questions or issues later on. We have this theme of expansion. We touched it in, uh, touched on it in the uh, couple of slides back when we saw the map of where Amazon exists in the world. Um, and also just now in, in the previous slide, Amazon provides uh, a tremendous opportunity to expand your offering introduce your offering into different marketplaces. Um, we see the five general categories here, the EU, Canada, United Kingdom, US, and Mexico. Those, those are um, probably the easiest ones to get into. Other marketplaces require um, other particularities going with them. So uh, Saudi Arabia, you have to qualify as a citizen of a specific country. I'm a Canadian citizen, and uh, right now I do not qualify to sell in Saudi Arabia. Interesting, but there we go. In India, you have other requirements. You require a local partner. You require a local GST or goods and services tax, roughly equivalent to uh, a VAT um, a tax number there. You also require a local phone number, a local SIM card. So the, the ones that we've got on the screen here are probably the easiest ones to, to get into. So if you're already established in the UK, then there are certain tools that are available to you within the Amazon ecosystem that will allow you to expand into the EU, Canada, United States, and Mexico. Um, so that, that's really quite helpful and, and quite a, a great way of launching. Uh, the corollary, of course, is that if you're in another marketplace and you want to expand here, that's possible too. So again, it's because of this consistency that's available to the buyer on Amazon, this consistency that's available to the seller by and large on Amazon, and also the fact that Amazon are always forward thinking and they're always seeing what's coming down the pipeline. If there is a challenging issue, such as a particular trade issue, getting stock from the UK, into the EU, Amazon will try to work with you to try to find a way to overcome whatever that issue is. It's not always possible, but they are making best efforts to make the process of internationalization and expansion easy. Now, I should pull back for a second and say that this, that there, there are elements of this on other marketplaces. So I'm thinking about eBay in particular eBay does have a global presence and eBay is available in other marketplaces. 
but I would argue that the amount of support that eBay offers is not to the same extent as the amount of support that Amazon offers for new sellers and existing sellers too. So if you're considering a journey onto Amazon, let's have a think about the top product categories that will exist. And I think a lot of these are probably gonna be pretty obvious. I think we, if, if, if any of us have purchased on Amazon, we've probably purchased from one of these categories and you're using Amazon um, perhaps as a go-to. You know, the old adage is that a lot of people go on to Google to research and Amazon to buy. So you probably have, a consumer probably has a specific product or specific need in mind, is prepared to make a purchase decision pretty quickly and they'll go directly to Amazon. That's, that's the nature of a lot of these uh, customer journeys. So going down the list, apparel, beauty, baby, books, electronics, health, garden and home, home and kitchen, jewelry, fitness, toys. Each one of these will have their own compliance requirements. So for example, if you're selling in the garden and home space, if you're selling in the fitness space, if you're selling in the, let's say books, uh, and yeah, those, those are the ones that I'll highlight. And oh, well, I guess to an extent apparel, then it, it will probably be pretty easy to get onto Amazon and sell your products. If you're in beauty, baby, health, and toys, there will be some additional levels of compliance that Amazon will want you to, to answer. Maybe um, uh, safety marks. So that was the old CE marks uh, that we used to have when, when we were part of the EU. Uh, maybe there will be other um, proofs of any claim of success that your product will make. So in, in if you're thinking about getting onto Amazon or if you're thinking about expanding into other categories, do consider that there are going to be times when you're going to have to supply additional compliance documentation to satisfy, to satisfy Amazon's uh, curiosity and, and intention that you are able to sell and, and you're able to support the products that you, you want to introduce. Um, now, perhaps you are looking for different areas of, uh, of inspiration. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about how to get uh, ideas if you're just starting out or if you are considering opening up uh, in other marketplaces and other product lines and other sectors. Um, we've got a few different examples here. So Amazon itself, that's the graphic in the, in the top left-hand corner. As you browse Amazon, what I'd, what I'd really encourage you to do sometime is, you know, I, I made the comment just a few minutes ago that if you go onto Amazon, chances are um, you're there to buy. You're there to um, actually make a purchase, make a commitment and uh, use some particular product that, that, that you know that you need. The next time you go on, just have a play, just have a hypothetical look at different products, go into different categories, different um, search terms, go into different, um, you know, uh, rankings into different stores and just play around, just see what's there. Um, maybe do different filters at different price points, uh, different star ratings. Um, you know, typically when I go on, I look for products that are trading at four and five stars and uh, to see what their reviews are like before I actually make a, a commitment. Have a look at what the one and two star um, uh, competition is doing. In that way, that's a great lesson to learn in terms of not doing whatever they're doing, right? It's, it's almost the opposite. You, you can kind of look to, to the people who are further ahead of the game to look at them as leaders in their particular field, but equally you can see the uh, organizations, the products that are having problems, and you can see why they might be having problems so that you can factor that into your own business. So for example, if you see that a product is getting a lot of complaints about its usability or the fact that customers thought that they were buying one thing and actually got something else, that helps you consider 
how you're going to list the product, what terms you're going to use to explain the product. Um, or indeed, if there are shipping issues, it helps you consider, well, how do you adapt your back office, your warehouse, your shipping policies, all that sort of behind the scenes stuff so that it's um, an easy and comfortable and pleasurable experience for the customer. Over to the right, we see graphics like Pinterest and there are various other sites out there. So Pinterest um, takes all of its data and, and looks at what its, its customers are and, and, and users uh, are looking at and um, predicts what the next year of demand is going to look like. So we've got Pinterest uh, predicts for 2022. They've also done 2023. I'm sure they're going to do 2024 with 23, 23 data. So they're, they're looking at what people are looking at now and seeing where the trends are developing. So we have a broad range of images here um, that, that show you potentially what people are looking at on Pinterest and potentially factoring in what the demand might be later in the year for those items. That's another good um, issue and that uh, speaks back to some of the brand um, discussion, the brand pages that we talked about earlier. So for example, the song mix uh, slide that we saw earlier. Seasonality. Here we are at the end of March. If you're looking at introducing new products into any online marketplace, but again, I'll, I'll reference Amazon, now is about the time to do it. Don't forget, we've got uh, the fourth quarter coming up at the end of the year. People start buying for Christmas around September. Now is about the time to start thinking about what products you want available for Christmas. Now is about the time to start looking at creation of listings and getting your photography done and thinking about um, your promotions and social media. We'll be talking about that a little bit later in, this, in, the, in the presentation. Listings are a little bit like fine wine. You want to get them started off and get them aged so that they can be optimized and ready for the true demand towards the end of the year. You don't want to come up with errors or problems or do um, split testing in September. You want all that sorted out now. There will be course correction that will have to happen. There will be edits, there will be tweaks, of course. These things do happen. Get the majority of that work done soon in the next probably two to three months so that you can be ready for, for the Christmas period. Um, we also referenced the trend report here. So again, it, this just supports the fact that there are a number of different reports out there, um, particularly for your industry, for your sector. Maybe you are in, in baby products, maybe you are in food and drink, maybe you're in, you've got a larger product there um, that requires special handling or special courier service, or maybe it's particularly delicate or perhaps customization. But do have a look at whatever uh, is relevant to your industry in terms of what the trends are and make sure you get out to the relevant trade shows and keep your eyes open as to what the competition is doing and what the new opportunities for you are going to be. So we've touched on, on listings here. Now, you'd, you'd kind of expect a Canadian to introduce maple syrup at some point. <laughs> so here we are. This is um, one of the products that we do sell on Amazon. Um, it's maple syrup based uh, cookies. It's one of our more popular sellers. And we've been working with this brand now for about five years, um, helping them on Amazon and off Amazon. Um, this is a really exciting journey, uh, actually, for us because we've seen the brand develop a number of different options and different uh, product lines. So exactly what I've been talking about through through the presentation so far. Um, now, maple syrup. This particular product comes from Quebec, uh, one of the provinces in Canada, and it's a major, major uh, player in the maple syrup market. Interestingly. Uh, maple syrup is the only commodity that is valued um, in Canadian dollars. Oil and gold and various other things are valued in, in US dollars or, or euro or, or maybe some other currency, but maple syrup is the only commodity in the global um, kind of trading marketplace that's valued in Canadian dollars. So there's your, your fun tip for the day, your, your fun bit of trivia. But anyway, um, syrup comes in a number of different varieties, anything from sort of a, a light 
uh, kind of beigey color to a more uh, rusty, dark red, uh, robust color. So that's that's the first area of variation that we've been playing with. Um, another area of variation is the uh, where it stands out. The the particular syrup that we're dealing with is a great taste award winning product. So. Um, there are several syrups that, that you can buy in various uh, high street grocery stores, but this one really stands out. And we really do celebrate, um, certainly on the maple syrup listings, not so much on the cookie listing, but the awards that, that it's won. There are size variations that happen as well. Um, currently, we're working with a 250 milliliter, roughly 300 and a bit gram uh, product. So it's a beautiful glass bottle with syrup inside. But we're also looking at... Um, maybe some off Amazon uh, sales as well, some off Amazon B2B uh, products where we have a 40 milliliter bottle. So that's um, you know kind of very individual personal size serving that you get in a hotel, straight up through to 200 liter drums where uh, larger organizations uh, and manufacturing would use that in their manufacturing process. We do other variations. Uh, there's popcorn. So we've partnered with Joe and Steph to offer um, um, maple syrup uh, flavored popcorn. And of course, we're coming to the cookies. So this is just um, part of that brainstorming exercise that you go through to say, well, what is right for the customer? What does the customer want? Do they want something? Are we ready to deliver to the customer what they need? A smaller product, a larger product, a different flavor, a bundle, for example. So typically around Christmas, um, there is a lot of demand for bundles. One of the three grades of maple syrup that I've just mentioned and cookies to go with it, or a, one of each of the three gra grades packaged in a nice box. So do think about these different opportunities and look at what your on Amazon and off Amazon uh, sales are looking like. Don't forget about the opportunity to leverage Amazon. And again, I, I keep coming back to Amazon as a catch-all phrase for a number of different marketplaces. So we'll be touching on some of those other marketplaces down the road later in this presentation. But um, whether it's, it's Amazon or whether it's eBay or whether it's uh, another one, look at your e-commerce marketplace as a showcase. Look at how your product is being represented, not just for the customer that is about to buy, because they, they feel quite hungry and want, um, you know, they've got guests coming over tomorrow and they, they want um, some biscuits with, uh, with a tea in the afternoon. But look at what the opportunities are gonna be like three months down the road, six months down the road. Let me give you an example. Over on the right, well, we've got a number of boxes, number of areas that are highlighted in red, but have a look at the one with the star rating. When we took this, uh, this slide shot here, we had 22 ratings on this particular product and you can see that they're all five stars. That's great. Anyone who's undecided about what product that they want to sell or, or buy rather, maybe they're comparing us with someone else, they're gonna be looking at the star ratings. They're gonna be looking at the reviews that people have made. They're gonna be looking at the different ideas. Someone said, oh, you know, I've got, visiting Canadian friends who are coming, it'd be great to welcome them with a box of something from their homeland. Uh, or, um, you know, I've got, I have an interesting corporate gift that I want to give. Let me give them something a little bit different. You know, everyone is going to have a different need, a different driver, and do go in and have a look at those ratings uh, to see what people are commenting on so you can feed that into your future marketing messages. But the point that I'm driving at here is, if you have a future customer or if you have a B2B order that you're trying to negotiate, this is a very public showcase where you can direct your prospective customer to, to say, look, we're talking about it. I've answered your questions in terms of product and functionality and cost and so on. Um, I've given you a sample. Um, maybe you're still undecided go into a public forum like our Amazon listing and see what other people are saying. Amazon have very, very tight controls about what they will and will not allow in terms of customer reviews. They want honest customer reviews. So that is a great way of positioning your product to someone off Amazon to say, look, it's a reliable product. Okay. 
moving on into the anatomy of a listing here. And this is going to hold true for the other marketplaces that we'll be talking about later. And indeed, your own, maybe your Shopify store or your website or perhaps your Instagram page or whatever the case is. There's some conventions out there that are just good practice to, to keep. So first one, images. Now, every marketplace is going to have its own rules around what's acceptable for images. So in the Amazon world, you can have up to nine images. You can have um, most of those images showing the product in use, what they call uh, lifestyle images. The first image, so we can see that this box of cookies fills the entire screen. And over on the left, near the word photography, we've got highlighted a handful of images here with the first one right on top being this one that we're seeing uh, enlarged in the middle of the screen. It has to be, according to Amazon rules, it has to be the product taking up 80% of the space and white background taking 20% of the space. Okay. And again, if you're following Amazon's rules, chances are, it's not always correct, but chances are the requirements will be consistent on other marketplaces. So we link for example, our Amazon marketplace to um, our eBay marketplace using uh, a, a third party integrator product called Joe Lister. You pay a monthly subscription for that. And Joe Lister will grab the products that we're selling and that we want on Amazon and that we want to sell on eBay. We'll grab all of those details and just publish them straight away. So you can see that what we've generated on Amazon is consistent already with the eBay marketplace, okay? So that first image has to be product on a white background. Clear image, um, you have a number of different options there. Depending on, I would say, the valuation of your product and your brand reputation and so on, you might want to go with studio quality images. Now that can get expensive. That's hiring out a professional to take uh, a full day shoot or possibly a couple days shoot of different images against different backdrops and different settings and so on. And that can run in the several hundred of pounds. Now, for both um, Android and um, iPhones, and I think probably some of the other architectures out there as well, there are apps that you can download quite easily and take a picture of a product with your smartphone and the app will format the image to get rid of all the distraction in the background so that it's compliant with uh, the Amazon uh, marketplace. So there are a few out there. If you just search in your, in your iStore or Android store, you'll be able to find one that suits you. Generally, you get a few images free of charge so you can play with that. And then generally there's a monthly subscription that goes with that, maybe 10 pounds or something like that. But it's, um, it's a great way of just getting started if you're not ready to take that leap and go for studio quality images. Now, the other images can be lifestyle images. So this is what we've got here. Um, they're, they're quite tiny thumbnail images, but they're things like cookies and a serving of tea or cookies on a platter or cookies coming out of the kind of plastic um, uh, kind of casing that holds them all and make sure, uh, make sure that they don't get damaged in transit. The very last image, I'm not sure if you can see that, but that um, actually shows the ingredients and the, um, the, the energy levels and, and, and so on and so forth of that particular product. So again, we're declaring that right up front and helping the customer make that decision. If they're happy to have a product that contains wheat, then we're telling them straight away before purchase, this has wheat. If they're happy to have a product that has a certain sugar level or carbohydrate level or salt level or whatever, we're declaring that straight away. Now, there are other places where you can do that on the listing, but we're happy to make that statement straight away so that the customer has every single option possible to make a purchasing decision because that I would rather not have a customer, you know, have a customer change their mind about purchasing my product and have a customer be disappointed and then have to go through uh, the returns process. Okay, so we're giving all that information straight up front. Okay, looking at some of these other boxes, um, 
we declare right up at the top, pure maple, Canadian maple cream cookies and so on. Um, we're, we're keyword stuffing a little bit there, and that's not, uh, not great in general, but uh, it's a little bit um, tricky just because the brand of this product is called pure maple. And also uh, that's a descriptor for the type of maple syrup out there. So we do only use pure maple syrup. Um, but as you can see, we're quite descriptive and we do use the space that Amazon makes available for us. Now, this particular product also comes as a bundle, two boxes or four boxes or eight boxes. So again, we declare that right in the title, you're getting one box. It's all about making it as clear as possible in as many different places as possible. So it appeals to whatever type of shopper you're going after. Again, we've got the people who are um, more visual. We've got people who are more text-based shoppers. So we want to make it very, very clear to those people. Going back to that box where we highlighted the star rating, notice that there's a badge there, black background with white and orange writing called Amazon's Choice. Now there's an algorithm that Amazon uses to rank your products and that's called A9 and it's kind of verging on the A10 algorithm as well. That's a bit of the secret sauce behind Amazon's success. It takes a number of factors into account. It takes the reputation of the seller, the reputation of the product, the amount of stock that is available and a number of other factors into account um, to rank your product. Jeff Bezos considered um, this, this concept of a flywheel. So basically the, the more you put into your listing, the more advertising you, you pay for, the better quality your, your product and your customer service is, then the higher Amazon will rank you. The more prominent your product will be. You won't be buried in the, on the 20th page someplace. You might be a little bit further up on the third page of search or the second page of search or the first page of search, even high up on the first page of search and give your product that much of a better chance to be the first one that the customer sees for that impulse purchase. That's kind of a reward that Amazon gives you for putting in the effort to make it a success. When you follow all those rules and when you tick all the boxes and when you fill in all the right information, you've got a, straight, a really strong chance of being recognized by this A9 algorithm to be Amazon's choice. And consider the linkage with Alexa as well. When someone is sitting at home and says, Alexa, order me a box of pure maple syrup Canadian cookies, well, guess which product is going to come to the door? Right? It's because we've made the effort to make this as compliant as possible and given the customer as much information as possible and put in as much stock as is reasonable, not as is possible, because we could have put in tens of thousands of units, but reasonably several hundred units at any given time. And uh, Amazon and A9 like that. Going along. We've also turned on other different features. So we've got the promotions here. So we, we operate to very tight margins. It doesn't look like a, a fantastic saving if you buy two boxes, but there is a really, really tight margin. This is an expensive product. It is Canadian. It's, it's not like we can um, produce uh, British maple syrup <laughs> uh, cookies, or at least I'm not aware of that. Uh, so we've got shipping, we've got various other factors that are coming in. So we, we do our best to try to give a little um, incentive, whatever is possible, to um, ensure that customers will, will buy more of our product at once. The next box down, we have filled in all of the, the fields there for brand, item weight, specialty, and package weight, and so on. That matters. That's important. If you have product that's sitting in Amazon in their warehouses, and even in your own warehouse, it's important to know product dimensions and weights because of shipping costs. Estimation is okay, but it's really, really good idea to be as accurate as possible. If you've got some good uh, scales in your office or, or in your warehouse, then fantastic, use that. But also if you put stock into Amazon, you can request an Amazon specific measurement of your product. And they will do something ridiculous like get you down to 
um, weights and dimensions of up to 10 decimal places. It's, it's crazy. But what that means is that if the actual is a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter than what you've estimated and what you've declared to Amazon, then perhaps you're going to be saving a little bit of money on shipping because you got a smaller product. It also works the other way, and it could be that you're going to be spending more on shipping because you're a couple of grams over that threshold. So do try to measure at home or in your office and compare against the Amazon rate card. It's a nine page PDF document that's available um, freely on the internet. Just search for Amazon rate card UK. You can download that and um, have a look at all the permutations and combinations of, of, of shipping costs so you can get an idea for what Amazon is gonna charge you. But accuracy and measurement really, really matters. The last bullet point down at the bottom, the last box, we're showing two out of five bullet points that you can have in your listing. And again, this will carry over to other marketplaces. For example, the range, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, allows for 10 bullet points. Amazon only allows for five bullet points. The bullet points on the range are shorter than what we've got on Amazon. Depending on category, you have different lengths. So in DIY and tools, the character length is something like 100 characters, I believe. Whereas here in, in food and drink, food and grocery, it tends to be around 200. So use the space that Amazon gives you. Think about the keywords, do your research, do your predictive search. So in Google, when you type in and you start typing in maple cookies, well, before you hit search, there's that list of, of options that it gives you. Are you really looking for maple syrup cookies or maple Canadian cookies or large box of cookies or whatever the case might be? What are people searching on? Think about those words and how they factor into the listing. Okay, um, I will just say one more thing on the right. Um, it's not highlighted by our red boxes, but you can still see it. You've got the options there for one-time purchase or subscribe and save. So let's say you just want to have the one box. Well, you take that box that's um, kind of slightly shaded in blue there and you get your one product. Great, that's fine. But perhaps you want one of these uh, delivered every month. So for example, we have a, a little patio and there's a, a couple of bird feeders on the patio. We get bird seed delivered once a month. And the birds love that. They just go through it like crazy. And in exchange, the seller of our bird seed has said, well, look, um, you know, thanks very much, Chris, we'll, for being loyal. We'll give you a 10% 10, 10 discount with every consecutive product that you buy. Great, fantastic. So I set and forget it's the subscription model it's a little bit like paying your mobile phone insurance. You just subscribe and it gets charged to your credit card every month or your Amazon Prime or your Netflix or whatever the case may be. Okay, we're going to go on to the next screen here. Now, I just want to give you one quick moment. If you have any questions on anything that we've covered so far, um, if you want to put them into the chat and then we can cover them later on. If there's anything that comes to mind before we uh, go on to the next topic, that would be a good time to do it. Of course, we can cover them later on, um, but if there's just anything that comes to mind straight away, please uh, add that to chat. Okay, let's talk about advertising. Now I've alluded to this before um, and we'll go into uh, a little bit of uh, greater detail here. We're thinking about segmenting your market. So it's always a good, um, it's always good best practice. I'm sure you do this anyhow, but it's good best practice to think about who your customers are and think about what the opportunities are for your customers. So I gave that example with the maple syrup that five years ago, we started with um, just the three different grades of maple syrup. And then we got some feedback and we got to talking with people and through a bit of trial and error and, and maybe through a little bit of paid research as well, we um, learned that there would be a demand in the marketplace for other variations of the product. Now in Canada, everyone know, um, uh, knows maple syrup and, and it's just part of this, a staple of the diet. But in other marketplaces, including the UK, very often there is an educational piece that goes with it as well. We've got the 
um, you know, the development and, and, and the, the growth of popularity of American pancakes, Canadian pancakes over here, pancake day, waffles, that sort of thing. You can buy them pre-made at your local high street grocery store and then toast them up or you can make them from scratch and you can do gluten-free and this and that and the other. And hey, it's great to accompany that with something. Some people like syrup, some people like honey, some people like sugar, some people, there are different variations. So that's quite standard. But in our journey, what we found was that there was um, a curiosity about using maple syrup in other menus, in salads, for example, in flavoring um, uh, smoked salmon. So if you, if you look at Foreman's um, uh, smoked salmon, they use our syrup. So it's always this opportunity to talk with your customers and see the push-pull relationship. How can you take your existing product and open up new customer spaces, new client spaces, if you're talking a B2B sense? How do you use that customer and client feedback to develop new products? You might not necessarily um, need to create something brand new from scratch. It might just be a different size, a different bundle. So, Always take into account these four categories here. Geographic. Now, let's say you're very local in Hackney. Your product, is that a product that has a very short shelf life? Are you talking about products that are freshly cooked and need to be delivered quite quickly and therefore limited by geography? Are you talking about products that maybe have a longer shelf life, but need to ke be kept chilled? Where is that going to? How far um, can that product travel with or without chilling? If you're going um, outside of the, the boundaries of Hackney and London, and, and maybe even the Southeast, if you're going up to Scotland, if you're going to Wales, if you're going into Northern Ireland, what are the mechanics of shipping that product to those other marketplaces? Are there local tastes? If we're maybe going to a vastly different country, if we're going to France, if we're going to Germany, is there local translation that needs to happen on the product? Are there local compliance rules that need to happen? So very often we, we look at um, our local territory and we say, look, that's quite easy. How do we um, um, e exploit other opportunities that exist in our local marketplace. And often we tend to think, or, or, or we tend to discourage going outside of our local territories because, well, that gets difficult and complicated. So we were selling when the UK was still part of the EU. We continue to sell post-EU. Originally, seven years ago, selling to Maastricht was as easy as selling to Manchester, okay? Now there are different factors in place. We didn't stop selling to the continent, but we've changed our approach, again, to adhere to local new rules and compliance and, and duties and customs and so on and so forth. Demographic, who is your product aimed at? Our toys, we do sell a range of toys. We do not make them available or advertise that they're available for under three years old. They have little bits and pieces in them. They're safety tested for three years and over, but we discourage um, any thought of buying them for under three-year-olds. But very obviously and very clearly, a three, four, five, ten-year-old is not going to be the one to actually buy they will make that demand. So if there are any parents in the group, <laughs> I sure know that there's, there's a request that comes up and it's the adult that makes the purchase. So you're looking at who your demographic is and selling to both, um, I guess both parties in that, in that case. Looking at age, you're looking at particular taste, celebrations, we have Ramadan on now, and then, of course, later in the year, we have Christmas, just taking two, two examples. Who is it that you're actually selling to? And how much lead time do you need to give them to make a purchasing decision? Behavioral. 
So that lead time concept feeds into behavioral as well. What is your customer like? What, what do they like to do? How, do they like to have um, products on a subscription basis? Will they be repeat customers? How quickly do they use their product? We were talking with uh, a food and drink brand um, a few weeks ago um, about their particular product, which is a product that's available in concentrate. Um, and we're looking at different scenarios of how a customer would use that. It had a, a lifespan of 40 days. Um, it's, I'm, I'm trying not to give too much away here. <laughs> it, uh, as I say, it was a concentrated product. If there was a single individual living alone using that product, then clearly that product would take a certain amount of time to consume. If it was a family of four, for example, then that product could be consumed a lot more quickly. So is a monthly reorder um, uh, sensible for the individual? Yes, probably. Is a monthly reorder sensible for the family? Probably not, that's too infrequently. So they might need to buy two units at a time and then have a monthly, or they might need to be able to buy it every fortnight. And then we'll, we're going to psychographic. So what makes the customer tick? What do they believe in? Do they believe in sustainability? Do they have particular ethical values? Do they have particular uh, religious um, you know, concerns? What, what makes the, the customer that individual and how do you appeal to that customer? All of these are important in your segmenting so you can think about how to position that product to that end customer. Going on to here, we're returning back to the maple syrup example and the maple cookie example. When you type in maple, there are lots of products that become available. Why does ours get the badge? Partly because the quality of product, partly because of seller reputation, partly because of product reputation itself, but there's clearly something that we are communicating to the customer in a way that resonates well with the customer and Amazon recognizes that. The other products that we see on screen are not ours, but it's very clear. They look like very strong promise, promising products. They've got high star ratings. It looks like their price point is very accurate. Uh, they've won some awards. They've got the Great Taste Awards. They're certified B Corp. There's, they've got a lot going for them. Why is it that we get the badge? So that's something to think about. So in terms of the various promotional um, uh, kind of streams that are available to you, we need to be thinking about, um, I guess, the top three here, video marketing, website, social and mobile uh, marketing as well. So video marketing, this sells, you know, in, in the TikTok age, it, it's the, the kind of genuine user of review. It, it's important, of course, to have professionally done videos that highlight your product, that showcase your product, um, that demonstrate how the product can be used, that show the product when, when you can't, the customer can't touch and feel that product the way they can in a high street store. Video and images and description, all that comes together to help inform the customer's uh, decision. A professional video to put your best foot forward, to make the product look attractive and appealing and inform the customer will help. But equally, on the other side, where you have your influencers and your reviewers and so on and so forth that do the more amateur, more spur of the moment, the ad hoc videos, that shows that it's genuine and being genuinely consumed and genuinely used in the market. And so it's important to consider your promotional strategy as having those two sides of the video coin. A website. You need this for uh, a number of different, uh, different reasons. You can say a lot on Amazon. You can talk about your brand. You can talk about the listing. You can talk about um, a wide range of, of subjects there. 
You can activate certain brands on Amazon to indicate uh, sustainability or to indicate uh, compliance with certain national um, you know, legislation and so on. But on your own website, you control the message fully. So if there's contact information that you want to uh, display, that's where you do it on your website. Remember that on Amazon and most other marketplaces, you do not own the customer. The marketplace owns the customer. If you drive traffic to your own website and build an email list or do a redirect to Amazon in some way or whatever, you own the customer as well as the e-commerce marketplace like Amazon. So it depends what your strategy is. It depends on how much effort you want to put into it. It depends on um, how much you're also willing to, to spend on driving traffic to your own marketplace, your own uh, website, excuse me. There are other interesting things that you can do with your website. So if you have a Shopify uh, website, there are plugins that you can get to connect your website to an Amazon marketplace. You can use um, a PayPal button. You can use an, an Amazon buy button. You can use a lot of that and integrate that on your own website. So a customer will use one of those trusted checkout facilities and then Amazon or PayPal or Shopify, excuse me, um, uh, gosh, what's the other one I'm looking for? Stripe will just use whatever credentials the customer already has in order to fulfill that order and, pro and, and process that checkout. Okay, uh, social and mobile marketing, of course. This is where we're talking about TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever um, social media channel you feel is best to accurately display your product and market your product. That's where you do the updates. That's where you do um, maybe some promotions. That's where you can drive traffic to your own website. But also think about the tools that are emerging on a lot of these marketplaces. Again, I refer back to Amazon and doing Amazon Live. What about, this, this is a little bit like where say the QVC shopping channel meets Instagram. So you register, you log in, you, you, you make this facility available to you. There's some preliminary steps that you need to take uh, before that happens, but you can go live almost like live TV and talk about your product, demo your product, test your product, wear your product if it's clothing, et cetera, et cetera. So start thinking about what the marketplace offers in terms of your ability to promote your product and drive traffic back to the marketplace. It becomes an easy one or two step process where the customer watches you demo your product and says, yeah, I want one of those and immediately click to buy directly off Amazon. And of course, using the entire Amazon ecosystem to have that product delivered to your home. Expanding this thought out, you might also want to consider um, uh, PR, public relations. Do you have a new product that you want to get into, um, into the marketplace? Do you have a variation? Do you have something exciting, something particularly different? Do you have an ongoing solution to a customer problem? This is where it makes a lot of sense to um, get into marketplace, into, into magazines and publications and so on. Perhaps through your sector, you know people who are um, connected with some of these trade journals and, and some of these con consumer publications. Maybe locally within Hackney, there are maybe some, some local publications that are relevant to your particular product or service. We had a really nice um, surprise when you're about, uh, well, actually it was last Christmas, not, not the one just gone, but the previous one. If you look in the middle of this graphic, um, you see a salt and pepper cruet set. And they're both in the shape of the Elizabeth Tower with Big Ben someplace in the middle there. Um, well, the Evening Standard picked that up and said that this is one of the, I don't know, the top 10 gift ideas um, for that particular Christmas. and. I, I can't remember how we, uh, we, we got connected there, but I think it was something like Harrow, H-A-R-O, Help a Reporter Out, um, a daily digest of um, 
requests from journalists for experts or for sample products in a wide range of different subjects. Most of them tend to be US based, but occasionally there's something um, that's of interest to, to the UK where you can say, hey, I've got a thing that you're, that you're looking for for your upcoming publication. Let me send you a sample so you can review it. Of course, you can always hire a professional agency as well. So again, it, it depends on budget. Legwork that you can do on your own and maybe um, some lessons learned uh, locally on your own just by speaking to, to maybe journalists who you know or, or local publications. Or indeed, you can hire out agencies who have those contacts, who know how to um, frame and shape the offering so that it's most appealing to journalists. We'll go on to communications. Again, I keep coming back to the fact that Amazon, I'm using that almost as a catch-all for all the e-commerce uh, sites out there, but particularly because they're so far ahead of the game. The standards that Amazon set, I mean, they, they've, they've got this goal, as we saw in one of those early slides in this presentation, they want to be Earth's most customer-centric company. And again, with the shopping that we've done on Amazon, we know that the experience has been relatively painless. Maybe things go wrong here and there, but generally nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, 999 times out of 1,000, it works. So they set the rules, they set the standards. They may seem counterintuitive to what we know as sellers. They may seem challenging to the business framework that we've established within our own companies. But if you want to play the game, you got to play by their rules. So I'll give, me, uh, I'll give you a few uh, examples of this. Buyer and seller messages. So I've already said that Amazon owns the customer. So if a customer goes on Amazon and buys your product, they own the customer. You cannot, full stop, you cannot put a flyer into your product that says, oh, sign up for uh, a newsletter, or hey, you've bought the blue variation of my product, why don't you get the red variation for 10% off or something? You cannot do that. The next topic, be available and responsive. Amazon require you to respond, or require us as sellers to respond to any customer query within 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours. So those customer queries could be stuff like, my product never came. Um, my product, uh, it shows as delivered, but I've never received it. It came broken. Um, I ordered a blue and I got a red. Uh, I want an invoice for my product. Um, I'm not happy and I want to return it, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of any customer query that you get needs to be replied to within 24 hours. They don't care if you're on holiday. They don't care if you're sick. They don't care if you're busy handling some sort of um, you know, issue within your, your, your business. The customer needs to be responded to. Now, there is a technique where you can say, well, look, dear Mr. Customer or Miss Customer, we're looking into this and we'll come back with an answer soon. But generally, we don't encourage that. Get the issue solved and out the door and dealt with, as I'm, I'm sure you're probably doing already in, in, your, in your businesses, but Amazon really requires that. Otherwise, your so-called account health gets damaged. Your account health is a ratings scheme that Amazon uses to ensure that we as sellers are being compliant with all of their rules. And if we start breaching those contact times, the SLAs, the service level agreements, then our account health starts to suffer. We got docked a few points initially going from a green potentially going to an amber. We get docked a few more points. If we go from an amber to a red, depending on where we are on that red scale, it could mean that your account is suspended or just outright stopped. And Amazon are very um, smart with regards to this. They, they don't want to let rogue sellers create accounts, create disappointing customer experiences, disappear into the ether, and then start up new accounts. So they will look at things like your credit card, your company name, your address, your IP address, um, who has a seller account already, 
and they will match that against their database to say, hang on, we've already given you a shot. You've broken the rules. We're not gonna give you a second uh, opportunity. Now, if you're not selling on Amazon already, and if you do have the intention to sell on Amazon, and this will go for other marketplaces as well, just a bit of a word of warning, do ask around if you're like in a shared office space or WeWork or something like that, do check if there's anyone near you that has established an Amazon account already. Because occasionally there's that um, slight confusion there where one person in an organization says, oh, it's a great idea for me to, to get this company on Amazon. Let me go through the registration process. Another person says, oh, we're going to do the same thing. And then all of a sudden, there are two accounts that are created for the same organization that maybe have matching information or very similar information. Amazon will look at that and say, no, you're not allowed to do that. We're going to kill off one or potentially both of them. So just make sure that no one else has registered an Amazon account um, before you start off on that journey. So these communications, again, to recap, you do not own the customer, Amazon owns the customer, but uh, there are ways of responding to customer needs, uh, responding to requests and so on. The importance is to be available and responsive and demonstrate that you are responding. Now, if you are selling with your stock in an Amazon marketplace, that's called FBA, fulfilled by Amazon. Generally, those areas that can go wrong that I mentioned before, product gets damaged or you know, needs to be returned or whatever the case is, generally Amazon will handle that for you. And there'll be some ex exceptions that get kicked back to you that you need to deal with. But as a rule, all of that gets, gets um, handled by Amazon. And I really recommend going that route. There is a cost. There is a, a fee that they charge, of course, and you need to factor that into your price of goods and, and retail costs and so on and so forth. But if there's anything that goes wrong, Amazon take the hit for that going wrong. Product gets misdelivered. If your product comes from an Amazon warehouse and goes to a customer, that's Amazon's issue to deal with. If a product comes from your warehouse and goes to a customer and it gets misdelivered or broken or whatever the case is, it becomes your, pro your problem to deal with. And therefore, you're setting yourself up for a negative seller review in that case. Okay. Uh, any questions so far on advertising, PR, communications? If you've got anything, please um, put it into chat and we can deal uh, with those questions in a short while. Okay. Let's go on to potential exit. So this is quite, has been quite a popular um, area of discussion amongst sellers over the last few years. A lot of brands will establish themselves, will put their best foot forward on Amazon and other marketplaces, will have that product and seller reputation, will expand out to different marketplaces, will demonstrate standard operating procedures, um, a viable business, profitable business, a lot of goodwill, a lot of customer, um, um, you know, large customer base and so forth. And then we'll look to exit. They're gonna say, look, after all of that investment that we've made in the organization and building up a brand, maybe we need to sell it to someone else. Maybe we need to sell it to someone bigger. Maybe you're in food and drink and you want to sell to Sainsbury's or you want to sell to, to uh, Waitrose. Um, maybe you've got a fashion product and you want to go into and sell out to a larger fashion uh, house. Maybe you want to sell to an aggregate. So this will be an organization that has specific experience in buying brands, building them up even further from a mezzanine level, and then maybe selling those brands off to an even larger organization. So that's something that you might want to consider. If you're just venturing out now, what does your exit look like in three years' time, in five years' time? Is this something that you want to do? Is this something that you might want to repeat? So you're trying it now for the first time, you sell out, and then you, you might want to do it again in the future. What it does, regardless of, of the, the age of your business and where you are on that journey, what this helps you do is look down the road two, three, four, five years, 
and say, what can I do now, not only to build the brand, but to make it attractive to an aggregator down the road? So I've mentioned SOP, Standard Operating Procedures. When you start off as a smaller entity, as a micro business, chances are the founder is pretty much doing everything, right? Dealing with all the customer service and dealing with the stock and dealing with the um, you know, accountants and lawyers and so on and so forth. And it's all stuck in the founder's head or possibly one or two colleagues. It's important to get that down on, on paper or on, in a Word document or a Google document or something like that. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be Shakespeare, it doesn't have, but it might just be a few different documents to say, okay, March, here are the three bullet points that I dealt with in you know, lessons learned on how to handle customers or um, how to optimize my supply chain or whatever. And then April, you add a few more bullet points. Then you know, May, you add a few more bullet points. And then maybe in six months time, you book a, a day just for yourself. Well, six months time, that takes you into Q4. I wouldn't recommend that. But you know, maybe January next year, you take a day to yourself and review all those notes and, and structure it a little bit more clearly so that in three or four years time, you've almost got an instruction manual on how to run the business. And that is very, very valuable to a company that might want to buy you out because they're saying, look, it's not just um, inventing rules every single day. Of course, we're always adapting every single day, but it's not just inventing rules. We're always referring to a consistent baseline. We always deal with customers in this way. We always deal, post on social media twice a week. We always do this. We always do that. Okay, so before we leave Amazon and get into other marketplaces, um, this will be a bit of a whistle stop tour. I'm just um, conscious of time here. Um, are there any questions on Amazon that you'd like to put into, into chat now? Anything that we've covered so far that you'd like me to come back to um, at, during our Q&A session in a few minutes? Okay, other marketplaces. So. We've, we've really talked about um, Amazon quite extensively. Um, yes, for some Amazon specific aspects, but also there are a lot of lessons learned there in how you present a product, how you manage your business, how you look at supply chain, how you um, interact with customers, how you um, think about variations and new marketplaces and new customer opportunities, which are gonna be absolutely consistent regardless of which marketplace you're working on, or even whether or not you've got your own uh, website, your own Shopify store. So many of you will be familiar with eBay. Um, the majority of my particular product is on Amazon. It just is for a bunch of reasons, a bunch of business decisions. But as I mentioned earlier, we use a product called Joe Lister um, to integrate stock from Amazon over to eBay. We're chosen, we've got about 2000 different SKUs. <clears throat> Excuse me, some of them, sorry, just one sec. Sorry about that. Some of those SKUs will be um, more popular than others. We've taken the, the top 100 of them and we've allowed those to transport over to eBay. So when a customer goes onto eBay, finds our product, um, they like it, they order it, it automatically gets fulfilled by Amazon. Some marketplaces accept that, other marketplaces don't. They want to have a non-Amazon branded package arriving at the customer's door. And SKU, I'm sure um, the audience will be familiar with that, but SKU just stands for stock keeping unit. So individual color, size, product variation of a particular item. We've got about 2,000 of them. The other thing to recognize here is that different customers like different marketplaces. Not everyone likes Amazon, and I accept that. That's fine. There, I've got loads of friends who 20 years ago started up their eBay um, accounts and love eBay. That's fine. eBay has been adapting to and changing and maybe some, taking some new best practice from a number of other marketplaces eBay is an extremely well-established and robust tool, and it's very, very appealing for a number of customers. Not everyone, but many. So our philosophy here is that we're taking a look at what our business capabilities are, <clears throat> excuse me, and 
trying to be in front of the customer in as many different places as possible. So with a relatively small team, we're looking at all of the trade issues and the cross-border issues and the customer um, cultural issues in various countries. And we're using Amazon to be in as many countries as we possibly can. Equally, we're looking to be on as many platforms as we possibly can. So we're on eBay through the mechanisms that I've described already. The range. So um, many of you will know this as a chain of department stores up and down the, the UK. Um, they offer pretty much everything that you need for your household. There are, there are dozens of locations across the country. Uh, there are something like 15,000, potentially 17,000 employees. Uh, they've been around for about 17 years. And about two years ago, they opened up a marketplace. Tesco has a marketplace. Walmart has a marketplace. Decathlon has a marketplace. So we know all these brands as high street shops, large um, sort of hypermarkets, if you will, in some cases. And they are now allowing sellers like us to use their marketplace services. Again, the standards that we learn on Amazon come into best practice and day-to-day -day usage on various marketplaces. I'm aware of that. We're uh, running a little short on time here, so I'll speed up here. Um, there are gonna be consistencies and there are gonna be some areas of, of difference. So as I explained earlier, when we're doing Amazon listings, Amazon like to have five bullet points that really highlight your product and really have a call to action there. The range in its listing structure will allow 10 bullet point listings. So you need to adapt for that. Vinted. So we're now touching on um, marketplaces that are sector specific, theme specific. So here we go, we're talking about clothing in the vintage space. Decathlon, sports. A lot of what I've said before in terms of making sure your, your seller um, profile is accurate, making sure your listing profile is, is accurate and clean and appealing, making sure your customer service, your supply chain backend, making sure all that works that will apply to each one of these marketplaces. Or perhaps we're aware of marketplaces that, um, that um, are, are make services available. So for example, um, uh, my business partner, who's actually on this call here today, <laughs> hi, uh, um, uh, he found a marketplace for trade shows, for staff, to support booths in trade shows so that you don't have to have all of your team come out of the office to attend a particular trade show. You can have some people in the office go to a trade show and have expert trade show marketers learn quickly about your product and be available to help you out and help, uh, and help support your product. So marketplaces can exist for pretty much any reason. Now, also I wanna talk about web optimization. So we're leaving the marketplace world and we're talking about web op optimization and experience within uh, the context of selling, of e-commerce, of pushing your brand forward. We have a few top tips for you here. So the first one is really to hone in on user intent. Creating your website is, is a bit of an art. You, you, you're thinking about your user journey. What is it that people want to see and want to, to have access to? Do they hit your website from a particular place? They've been referred from uh, an article someplace or from social media or a search engine or uh, a discussion at, at, a, at a drinks event one night. Why are they hitting your site? Once they're on, their, on your site, what is it that they're actually looking for? What does that journey look like? Is it just to get information? Are they looking for post-sale service? Are they um, uh, looking for support? Are they looking for instruction manuals? Are they looking for uh, the ability to buy another one of your, your products because they like it so much? You need to think about 
how that journey will translate into optimization for readers and for search. So readers as in humans that read your pages, but also screen readers as well to accommodate um, you know, people who need to, to access your site in, in various other forms, maybe have uh, text to speech options or larger font or uh, any number of tools to make it attractive to a wide audience base that, that may not be able to see or, or read or interact with kind of standard uh, basic text. And make sure that's consistent all the way out. Um, I've got a long career in IT and it's all about testing. Get your friends and colleagues who are maybe not so IT professioned to try to break the site. That, that's the, that's the, the, the keywords that we always like to use in the IT world. Get them to test it out and see if they can find a way to not make it work. And then that way, you know what gaps to fill, what little areas are, are working for a trusted audience or not working for that trusted audience so that you can make sure that your site is available for the rest of the world. Establish content authority. So think about what it is that you're saying. Think about the words that you're using. Look at the trends that we talked about earlier. Look at the keywords behind uh, your website. Think about the text that you're actually embedding into that, into that page. Think about um, things like using alt tags for images. Very often we just publish an image and hey, it looks great to, to most people. But again, when we're coming back to screen readers, those screen readers will be actively looking for descriptive text that, that talks about that image. You know, maybe a couple of words, this is a cup of coffee, this is a delicious cup of coffee, something that maybe some elements of your audience don't need help with because it'll be very obvious to them, but other elements of your audience do need some assisted help with so they can really interpret and get the best value from your site. Have a backlink strategy. So you're presumably linking out maybe to your online marketplace, a, a different store, a different, uh, you know, maybe some compliance organizations or what have you. Have a look at who's linking back to you. Form those quality partnerships. An ideal one is major broadsheets, major news outlets. So that goes back to our PR that we were talking about earlier. If you get some great um, press out there, that's linking back to your site. The search engines love that. They say, oh, look at that large newspaper out there, that broadsheet or you know, tabloid or whatever that has made its mark in the search engines. They trust your site, therefore we will trust them. and We will trust that link that is coming back to you. Finally, ensure that the experience is the same across web, social, and your marketplaces. Make sure your color scheme is consistent. Make sure your brand is consistent. Make sure your tone of voice is consistent. Make sure your customer responsiveness is consistent. I, I had a, a customer experience. I bought a product just before Christmas and I used the product and it was, it was very good. And, and I had a great, very positive experience. I bought this product off of Amazon and then it broke. Um, sort of three months into, into my purchase, it broke. And I reached back to the, um, to the seller on Amazon and I said, you know, this thing has happened. Um, I'm sure there's just a piece that maybe I can buy and fix the, the product. And, you know, 90% of it is fine. It's just something's broken. I don't know what can help me out. In that particular case, they had a relationship with, with Amazon, which allowed them to go off Amazon for uh, additional customer support. And the customer support, I must say, was very good. It was very consistent. I felt that the customer support that I got from them on Amazon in the very brief interaction that we had was at the same quality and level as the customer support that I got off Amazon. So to me, it felt like quite a seamless um, engagement. And then they very quickly solved my problem. And I was very happy with that. And I went back knowing how Amazon works and I went back giving them a five-star glowing review. It's this wonderful ecosystem, a, a virtuous circle that comes back and it's the consistency. It's making sure the customer is happy throughout. Okay, so we've come to, uh, come to the end of the session. Thank you very much um, for your, your kind attention uh, throughout. 
um, here's just some additional contact information for me. And I would absolutely love to have um, your, your questions.